Heavenly Father, we thank you and we praise you for all that you're bringing forth through your word. Thank you for the revelation of it. It'll be written in our heart and mind. Thank you that we're taking hold of it, the endurers of it. Praise you for all that you bring forth in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Please be seated if you would. We are sharing with you on the subject of laws and commandments, and we're talking specifically about the New Testament commandments, which absolutely are essential for you and I to know because we are under the New Testament, and we are now to walk after the New Testament commandments that God has given to us. And we are now beginning in Corinthians as we're going through the New Testament looking at these commands. It says that according as it's written, he that glorieth, let him glory in the Lord. The word here for glory is the one that is in the imperative mood. As we're looking at these words, we see the ones that are the imperative mood in the Greek, which are commanding statements. They're not just suggestions. They're not nice ideas. They're commands. You are to glory in the Lord. All the glory and honor goes to him. None of it goes to man. There's no glory to any flesh. All the glory goes to him. That's why we don't give glory to people at all whatsoever. Unfortunately, a lot of people out in Christian circles, they have a tendency to do that. That's a mistake. No, all the glory goes unto the Lord, and that's who we give glory to. We see in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, beginning in verse 10, it says, According to the grace of God, which is given unto me as a wise master builder, I've laid the foundation, another buildeth thereon, but let every man take heed how he buildeth thereon, thereupon. The word take heed is the commanding statement here in the imperative mood. This also is the present tense, meaning this is to be an ongoing thing that we're continually to take heed how we are building in our life. Because you've got to realize everything that you're doing, you're building something. You're building something that's good or you can be building something that's bad. We want to be sure we're only building the things that are in line with the Word of God. For other foundation can no man lay than is laid, which is Jesus Christ. Now if any man build upon this foundation, gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, stubble, every man's work shall be made manifest, for the day shall declare it, because it shall be revealed by fire, and the fire shall try every man's work of what sort it is. Every one of our works are going to be tried by fire. The question is, are they going to pass the test or not? Verse 14, if any man's work abide, which he hath built thereupon, he shall receive a reward. We're going to be rewarded for the things that are, we built that are the right things. But then he says, if any man's work shall be burned, it means it didn't pass the test. It was sin or it was of the flesh. It was wrong. He shall suffer loss. doesn't qualify what all it says beyond that. He's going to suffer loss. He's going to have some sort of damage, some kind of effect in the life to come. But he himself shall be saved, yet so as by fire. You'll still make it if you haven't denied the Lord, of course. Nonetheless, you could be suffering loss and not seeing the rewards that God purposes. God wants us all, of course, to be rewarded. He wants us to see great things happen and see blessings come forth and rewards in the life to come. That means you and I must take heed how we are building in our life. We see over in verse 18, he says, let no man deceive himself. That's the command. It means you and I could deceive ourselves. You know, the devil's out to try to deceive us, but we could even just do it ourselves, and he didn't have to do much work if we deceive ourselves. If any man among you seems to be wise in this world, let him become a fool that he may be wise. How would we be deceiving ourselves if we get wise in the ways of the world? God does not want us to be walking after the ways of the world. We're not to be conformed to this world, but we're to be transformed by the renewing of our mind. We are to be walking in the ways of the word. We're to come out of all the ways of the world. Remember that friendship with the world makes you an enemy against God. God wants us to walk in his ways. We see down in verse 21. Therefore, let no man glory in men, for all things are yours. Again, this is the same one about glory, command. We're not to glory in men whatsoever. All the glory goes to the Lord. Now, we honor men, as it says. We're going to give them respect, but we're not going to glory in them. No, all the glory goes unto the Lord. He, all the credit goes to him. He's the one that does everything. 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 1. So to love, let a man so account of us as of the ministers of Christ and stewards of the mysteries of God. What it's saying here is that so a man take account or, or reckon 
or he's to take into account as the ministers of Christ here he's talking about that you and I are, the, are to be stewards of the mysteries of God. Steward is like a manager of over it or a superintendent or someone who is head of something that's responsible for what they carry out. As God is revealing the mysteries of God to us, and you and I are ministers of Christ, you and I are going to be stewards of it, and we're going to give account before the Lord. And so he expects us to take, take hold of these things and give a good account unto the Lord as a good steward before him. In verse 5, he says this, Therefore judge nothing before the time until the Lord come, who will both bring to light the hidden things of darkness and will make manifest the counsel of the hearts, and then shall every man have praise of God. Praise is going to come from God toward us, not us doing anything of ourselves. Judge nothing before the time. God does not want us to judge. We've already seen, judge not lest you be judged. We're not to judge people. We are to judge righteously, as we saw. We are to make sure that things are right in line with God's word, but we're not going to judge people. He's going to bring to light all the hidden things of darkness. That means every one of us are going to, you know, we can't hide anything from the Lord. Everything's going to come to the light, that's for sure. So we want to be sure that we're doing the right thing. And remember, at the same time, as we talked before, but just bring this back to your remembrance, we do judge according to what is righteous. Judge not according to appearance, but judge righteous judgment. So we are to judge things whether they're in line with the Word of God or not. But again, we're not going to judge people. Judge not, lest you be judged. We see in 1 Corinthians chapter 4 another command that's given over in verse 16. He says, Wherefore I beseech you, be ye followers or imitators of me, Paul is saying. And so as he is following Christ and doing the Word, it talks about being imitators of Him. That means your eye is not on the person in a sense. You're simply doing the things that He's doing because He's doing what the Word of God says. So your eyes aren't on the person. Your eyes are on what they're carrying out, the actions, because they're doing the Word of God. So we don't follow a person, remember, but we are following an example that's shown by their actions. We see over in 1, Peter, or 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 7, another thing he says. Purge out, that is the commanding statement, the old leaven, that you may be a new lump as your unleavened. For even Christ, our Passover, is sacrificed for us. Leaven is a type of sin. God wants us to purge out anything that is not of the Lord, anything that is sinful. And in this case, this is in the context where the man was involved in fornication of having his father's wife, which was incest, and they had not dealt with it. They let this go by. That was a mistake. We cannot let things go by. Paul came to bring judgment upon this guy to deliver him to Satan until he would come to the place of repentance so he could possibly be saved in the day of the Lord Jesus if he would come to repentance. He says, your glory is not good. He said, know ye not that a little leaven, a little sin, will leaveneth or contaminate the whole lump. God wants us to deal with all areas of sin in our life. And he said, you've got to purge out this old leaven. You've got to purge this out. This is not of the Lord so that you are then unleavened, which would be sinless, walking blameless before the Lord. We see a scripture down in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, another command in verse 9. He says, Know ye not that the righteous shall not inherit, the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God. The unrighteous shall not. Who are the unrighteous? The ones who are not born again. Also, the unrighteous are those who have sin in their life and have not confessed it and dealt with it because sin produces unrighteousness. That's why we need to confess our sins. He's faithful and just to forgive us and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Then here's the commanding statement. Be not deceived. God is commanding us not to be deceived about this statement that he's made. Why would he be saying this? Obviously, when he says be not deceived, it means that the subject that he's talking about, people are being deceived out there about it. They think that, well, everybody's gonna be okay if they're born again, not so. The unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God. And then he begins to list out things, sin areas, that certainly would show that a person's not going to inherit the kingdom of God. He says, neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor the effeminate, nor abusers of themselves with mankind. This is a homosexual or a sodomite. 
He goes on and says, nor thieves, nor those that are covetous, that's someone who's greedy of gain, nor drunkards, this means intoxicated people, nor revilers, nor extortioners, robbers of some sort, shall inherit the kingdom of God. They're not going to see it happen. It doesn't matter if they're born again. People that are born again could be carrying out any of these things. They're not going to inherit the kingdom of God. He said, such were some of you, but they got, they washed, they got washed because they acted on the word. They got cleansed. They were sanctified, justified in the name of the Lord Jesus by the spirit of our God. As we walk in the ways of the Lord, we repent, turn from all sin, get cleansed, and praise God. We'll be fine. But if we continue in any of these areas of sin, then we are not going to enter into the kingdom of God. We see in 1 Corinthians 6.15, he goes on and he says, Know ye not that your bodies are the members of Christ? Shall I then take the members of Christ and make them the members of a harlot? God forbid. You cannot do that. Because if your body's the member of Christ and you join it with someone that you're not in covenant relationship with, which would be through fornication, then you've made your, a member of a harlot. That's wrong. What? Know ye not that he which is joined to a harlot is one body. The two shall, saith he, shall be one flesh. He that is joined unto the Lord is one spirit. Then he comes down, and here's the commanding statement. Flee fornication. That is a command. God expects you and me to flee fornication, imperative mood, present tense, always, continually, flee from fornication, any kind of sexual sin whatsoever. He does not want it in your life. If you've been involved in it, I trust you've confessed your sin, received forgiveness, cleansing from all unrighteousness, and you're now set the boundaries, and you have made the decision, I will never allow myself to engage in this again. Every sin that a man doeth is without the body. But he that committeth fornication, he sinneth against his own body. It causes a lot of physical problems. It'll open up the door for diseases and all kinds of problems. He goes on in verse 19. What? Know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost which is in you, which you have of God, and you're not your own. You and I have been bought with a price. We don't belong to ourselves. He bought the whole deal, spirit, soul, and body. We belong unto him. So he says you're bought with a price. Therefore, glorify God that's the commanding statement. He commands us to glorify God, as he says here, in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. That means your body belongs to the Lord. You can't do with your body what you want to do. You've got to do what God expects you to do with your body. You are to glorify him in your spirit and in your body. We see in 1 Corinthians chapter 7 over here in verse 2, he says, Nevertheless, to avoid fornication, let every man have his own wife, let every woman have her own husband. These are commands, commanding statements that are made. Then he goes on and says, let the husband render, this is a commanding statement unto the wife, do benevolence. Otherwise, you don't withhold the sexual relationship. The husband doesn't from his wife, and also the wife doesn't from the husband. That's a mistake. The wife has not power, or this is the word exousiazo, which means authority. The wife does not have authority over her own body but the husband. And likewise also the husband is not authority of his own body, but the wife. Otherwise you do not withhold sexual relationship in the marriage. That's a mistake. We've seen people do that. We've seen husbands hold, withhold from wives and wives withhold from husbands. That's a mistake. They are, they're contrary to the word of God. He says, defraud ye not one the other, except it be with consent for a time that you may give yourselves to fasting and prayer and come together again that Satan tempt you not for your incontinency or your lack of self-control. Therefore, this word defraud not is, means essentially to rob not someone from a sexual relationship in marriage. That's essentially what a person is due. That, again, is the commanding statement that, again, is made. We see over in 1 Corinthians 7, verse 20, it says this, another command, let every man abide in the same calling wherewith he was called. Whatever your calling is, that's what God wants you to abide in. It's a command. The way they, they do this sometimes, it just kind of just throws it out, let every man abide. It sounds like a good idea, but it actually means, literally says, every man abide. It's a commanding statement in the imperative. In the same calling wherewith he was called. Don't get outside of your calling. Don't try to be something that you're not. Abide in the calling you have. Some people have a tendency, they want to try to be like someone else. That's a mistake. You are to abide in the calling that God has upon you for you in your life. We see in verse 24, again, 
He says, brethren, let every man wherein he's called there and abide with God. Abide in that calling. Remain in it. Continue in it. Carry out the calling of God. There's a general calling for all of us, and then there's a specific calling according to the gifts, talents, or abilities, or anointings, or, or gifts of the Spirit, or whatever he has called you to. As you discover what all he has, he expects you to do what he commands you to do and abide and carry out that calling in your life. In verse 23, you are bought with a price. That means we belong to the Lord. Be ye not, or this really means to become not, the servants of men. What are we to be? We're to be a servant of God, servant of righteousness. We're not to be serving men and doing whatever they want us to do. No, we're going to serve the Lord. We've got to, you're bought with a price. That means who are you just be serving? Not men, but you are to be serving the Lord, the Lord in all that you do. 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 27 says, Art thou bound unto a wife? That means you're married. Seek not to be loose. That's a commanding statement. God doesn't want people to be divorced. Art thou loose from a wife? That means you're already divorced. Seek not a wife. That's another commandment statement. He's basically saying stay single. At the same time, he goes on and says, But if thou marry, thou hast not sinned. That means that remarriage is not sin. Many people teach that it's sin, but it's false teaching, evidenced by what we just see. This is talking about the guy that's loose from a wife, seek not a wife, but he says, but and if thou marry, you have not sinned. So it shows you people that t condemn people for being remarried, that's wrong. Don't listen to them. It's false. It's contrary to the word of God. It is not an area of sin. Does God want people to be divorced? Of course not. He wants them to be married, have good marriages, and stay married. Praise God. 1 Corinthians chapter 8, over in verse 9. Take heed, lest by any means this liberty of yours become a stumbling block to them that are weak. As you have liberty and you walk in the ways of the Lord, don't let anything that you do be a stumbling block to someone else. You have to have wisdom on how you are dealing with people so you're not a stumbling block to them in your life, to people that are weak. Over in 1 Corinthians chapter 9, a good example is where we talked about over in Romans 14, where Paul said, I'm persuaded there's nothing unclean. There isn't anything unclean. Uh, you can eat anything you want. It's not going to make you sin just by what you eat. Now, it may not be wise. You might be eating some things that aren't so good for you. But nonetheless, it's not an area of sin. Yet some people think that it's sin to eat certain things. And so you don't want to cause that person to be we who's weak, who doesn't understand, to, to fall stumbling block because of your liberty. So you have to be wise in how you deal with things. We see over in 1 Corinthians chapter 9, another command. He begins here in verse 24. He says, Know ye not that those which run in a race run all, but one receiveth the prize. So run that you may obtain. You and I are to run the race. And so this is a commanding statement. He's commanding you and us to run this race. And what are we seeking after? We're seeking after the prize, the high prize of the calling of God in Christ Jesus, all the promises of God, eternal life, all the things that he has for us. So we're going to run that race so we may obtain or be able to lay hold of it and take hold of what God has for us. Every man that strives for the mastery is temperate in all things. You and I are to be striving for the mastery. This means we're going to be contending with the adversary and conquering him in our life. You've got to be temperate. This means self-controlled. This is one of the fruit of the Spirit. God wants you self-controlled, temperate in all things. They do it to obtain a corruptible crown, but what are we after? We're after the uncorruptible crown, because you and I are going to enter in to what God has for us. I therefore so run. Remember, we're commanded to run, not as uncertainly. We know where, where we're headed. We are running according to God's word in the spirit, possessing the promises, conquering the enemies, pleasing the Lord, carrying out the ministry of the Lord. So fight I, not as one that beateth the air. We're going to be fighting the spiritual fight, engaging in that warfare against the enemies. We're not just beating the air. We know we're hitting the mark against these spirits as we are operating in the realm of the spirit. We see over in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, down here in verse 7, another commanding statement. He says, Neither be ye, or this word means become, idolaters. God does not want any idolatry in our life. Idolatry isn't just worshiping some god of stone or wood or brass or whatever like they did. Idolatry is anything that becomes a source other than the Lord. You can be an idol yourself 
A person could be an idol. A job could be an idol. Money could be an idol. Many people have actually made themselves an idol because they serve themselves instead of serving the Lord. They look to themselves. You know, God wants no idolatry in our life whatsoever. Every one of us are to turn away from these things. And here's where the people sat down to eat and drink, rose up to play. They were doing whatever they wanted to do instead of obeying the Lord. He goes on and says, Neither let us commit fornication. Some of them committed and fell in one day three and twenty thousand. God does not want us to commit any kind of fornication. It will bring curses upon us. Neither let us tempt Christ, as some also tempted or were destroyed of serpents. We tempt Christ when we don't do what he says, when we draw back from obedience to his word. And then we see in verse 10, Neither murmur ye, as some of them also murmured, and were destroyed of the destroyer. God does not want us to be murmurs, complainers, grumbling. Don't be a grumbler. Don't be a complainer. Don't be a murmur. You do things all under the Lord and rejoice, keep a rejoicing spirit before the Lord. All these things happen unto them for examples. They're written for our admonition upon whom the ends of the world are come. Then he says, Therefore let him that thinketh he standeth take heed lest he fall. You may say, well, I don't have any of those problems. That doesn't mean you couldn't. Any of us have the potential to fall if we don't continue in the things of God. That's why we always have to watch and pray so we don't enter into these things. And this statement, take heed, we see take heed is in a commanding, imperative mood often. We've seen it in many scriptures already. God commands you to take heed so you will not fall. He does not want any of us to fall. Remember, the Bible says he'll keep us from falling. We don't have to fall. And then he comes back again here and he says in verse 14, Wherefore, my beloved, dearly beloved, flee from all idolatry. Again, don't let anything be a source other than the Lord. Don't get your eyes on other things. Be sure that you're putting God first place. In verse 24, we see another command. Let no man seek his own, but every man another's. Now, the Welsh has been added in there by the translator. It's not even in there. What does that tell us? We're not to be selfish, seeking our own. All I care about is me, my house, us four, no more, forget about everybody else kind of attitude. No, we don't just seek our own, but every man another's. If someone has a need and you have an ability to administer and help out, reach out to help that person. Don't just be totally thinking about yourself. That's a selfish spirit. We see many people out there in the body of Christ, they're very selfish. They just seek their own. They could care less about anybody else. That's a mistake. You're to seek after another's, to help them to minister to needs in their life. Verse 31. Wherefore, whether we eat or drink or whatsoever we do, do all to the glory of God. Do is the commanding statement. Again, we've seen this several times about giving glory to God. Now it's talking about doing all to the glory of God. Everything that we should be doing is unto the Lord, give, bringing glory to Him. Again, we don't do things to ourselves. Remember that we don't live unto ourselves. We live unto Him who died for us. Because now we're bought with a price and we belong to Him. We see in 1 Corinthians 10, 32, another commanding statement where it says, Give none offense, neither to the Jews, nor the Gentiles, nor to the church of God. And this word really is, is the word ginomai, which really means to become. Become, essentially what it's saying is become offenseless. Be one who's not having, causing offense. Don't cause offense, and also don't take offense from others. Don't let things get you upset. Instead, you just keep your eyes on the Lord. You do things under the Lord. Do not become one who is causing offense to others. Become offenseless, that's what it means. We see over in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 1, he says again, be followers. This is the word mimetes, where we get a word mimic from, an um, imitator or a mimicker. Again, that's not following a person. You're just doing the things that you see them do which they should be doing the word. If they're not doing the word, of course you don't do it. You're going to be a mimicker of me, says, as I also am of Christ. He's following the Lord, doing what the word says, and we, of course, do the same thing. And that's what God expects. When we partake of communion, we do that. That's a commanding statement as well. When he gave thanks, he take and said, take, eat, this is my body, which is broken for you. Take and eat, these are commanding statements. We, why do we do communion when we do it? We do it in remembrance of what he's accomplished for us. Same manner also he took the cup when he supped, saying, This cup's the New Testament, my blood. This do ye as often as you drink it. In remembrance. This do ye. That's the commanding statement. He wants us to do these things in remembrance of what he has done for us. 
And whenever we do take communion, which you always bring out when we bring it out, it says, let a man examine himself. And so let him eat of that bread, bread and drink of that cup. Examine is a commanding statement eating and drinking. So you and I must examine ourselves that we do not partake unworthily, otherwise we'll be guilty of the body and the blood of Jesus and we'll have judgment come upon us. Now we come over to 1 Corinthians chapter 12 as we're looking at these commands in verse 31. 1 Corinthians 12 verse 31. It says, covet earnestly the best gifts, and yet show I unto you a more excellent way. Covet means to burn with zeal. To burn with zeal. It should be strong desire. There's a strong desire for the best gifts, talking about the gifts of the Holy Spirit. He wants to see the gifts of the Spirit come forth in your life. And remember, if you have the Holy Spirit in you, you have at least one gift. And so he wants those gifts to come forth in your life. 1 Corinthians 14.1 says, follow after charity. And the word follow actually means to run after. It's this word dioko, which means to run run after, run swiftly in order to get something. So we're going to run after love, always run after walking in love, charity. And desire, this is again the same word, burn with zeal, literally it means, be zealous for spiritual gifts, but rather that you may prophesy. God wants you to prophesy. As you get filled up with the Spirit, you praise and worship God, you pray in tongues, you're going to, and you seek after these things, He wants us to prophesy. God wants us to develop in the gifts of the Spirit. In fact, there's many commands in here in this chapter on 1 Corinthians 14 about the ministry uh, gifts operating. <coughs> it says in verse 12, <coughs> even so, ye, for as much as you're zealous of spiritual gifts, seek, that's the commanding statement, seek that you may excel to the edifying of the church. You want to seek to excel in the delivery of them and bringing them forth as exactly as the Lord wants to the edifying of the body of Christ. He also says, let him that speaks an unknown tongue pray that he may interpret. Now this is talking about when a gift of tongues you would have that would come forth. He's to pray that he's interpret. By the way, you might say, well, why don't we see the gift of tongues in, in assemblies of believers very often? The reason is because it's not necessary. Prophecy is what is going to speak what God wants to speak. What's tongue's purpose? 1 Corinthians 14, 22. Now, by the way, we're talking about the gift of tongues, not the prayer language of tongues. It's important you understand. There's a difference between the gift of tongues, which is one of the nine gifts of the Spirit, as the Spirit of God wills, and then the prayer language of tongues, which everybody has once you have the Holy Spirit in them that you can pray in tongues at will. Here it's talking about the gift of tongues. The tongues are for a sign, not to them that believe, but to them that believe not. So it's a sign to the unbeliever. If an unbeliever came in our midst, God might have a gift of tongues come forth. There would need to be an interpretation of it, though, to bring forth what the message is to the church. Prophesying, though, serveth not for them to believe, but it, it's for believers. That's why primarily what you see is prophecy that is going to come forth in the churches. We see another commanding statement in verse 20. Children, or brethren, be not children in understanding. Otherwise, by, by the way, the word be again is this word, ginnomai, which means become. Become not like children in understanding. Otherwise, he wants us to grow up. He doesn't want us to be like a little child in our understanding. You know, children grow up and they learn things so they can, you know, do, carry out the things that they want and grow up to be developing a manhood or, or womanhood so they can function on themselves. Well, God wants us to grow up spiritually as well. Howbeit in malice, talking about doing evil things, be as nepiazo, be as an infant. Otherwise, you, don't want, you want to be like you can't do anything. And nepiazo is a baby. He can't do anything. So as far as evil, you don't want to be doing anything like that. But an understanding, now he comes back to this understanding again. He says, it says in the King James here, be men, but it's not even a good translation. Be is the word become. Men is this word telos, telio, os, which means to come to perfection and completeness. Why they translate it men, who knows? It's not even close. King uh, Young brings out what it means. In the understanding, become perfect. It means not only does he want us to grow up in our spiritual understanding, but he wants us to become perfect in it and act exact in it by walking in it, carrying it out. It becomes our lifestyle. This is the way we're going to walk in all things. So he wants every one of us to grow up in all things. It's a command. It's not a nice little suggestion. He expects you to grow up in the things of God. Verse 26, 
How is it then, brethren, when you come together, that every one of you, every one of you has a psalm, or has a doctrine, or has a tongue, or has a revelation, or has interpretation? Otherwise, the Holy Spirit's quickening somebody to bring something forth. And you could have someone bring forth a song. You could have them bring forth uh, a doctrine, or a teaching, a word, or something. A uh, tongue, or a revelation, or interpretation. These are gifts of the Spirit. Let all things be done unto edifying. Whatever comes forth, it should be done unto edification of the body of Christ. The problem in Corinth was they were out having all kinds of things happen. They were, things were out of order. They weren't doing things decently in order. And so there were lots of problems. And he was coming to correct their misuse of the gifts of the Spirit and what they were doing in the churches. If someone does have a tongue, it says that there should be two or at the most by three and that by course and let one interpret. That's the commanding statement. Now, some people have also carried this over and said, well, this means you can't have more than two or three words that come forth, thinking it's referring to prophecies. Prophecies. I've heard people say that. Well, you can't have more than three prophecies, or you'd be out of order because it says at the most two or three. That's talking about tongues. It's not talking about prophecy whatsoever. Prophecy, everybody can prophesy, as you'll see. If there be no interpreter, let him keep silence in the church. Let him speak to himself and to God. Then it talks about the prophets. Let the prophets speak. Two or three, and let the other judge. These are commanding statements. This shows you how things are to operate in the church. If we had some prophets, we would have prophets give them free reign to be able to speak. We're not talking about someone who has a gift of prophecy or a word of knowledge. We're talking about someone who has a ministry gift of a prophet. They're standing in that office, which there were teachers and prophets that were in the church at Antioch, and they, God will bring them forth. If he raises any one of you up to be a prophet, then Prophets will stand up and they will speak two or three in the church and they're going to speak revelation that God gives them that's supposed to be spoken to the church. See, the Holy Spirit wants to operate in the church. He's going to operate through gifts that are placed in you, in me. We are to function in all these things. We need to grow, to grow up in all this. Verse 30, if anything be revealed to another that sits by, let him first hold his peace. He's to hold his peace if he has some revelation. Otherwise, he lets the prophet speak first. That's divine order. Let God bring forth those ministry gifts first, and then he holds his peace. Otherwise, you just don't blurt out what you want because I want to speak what I got or whatever. All. If we had to have prophets, we would let the prophet speak first. Otherwise, a an order is God would bring forth things. That's what he's talking about. Then we come down to verse 34. And what for some people has been like a mis highly misunderstood point here, unfortunately, in the body of Christ. 1 Corinthians 14, 34. Let your women keep silence. The commanding statement is keep silence. Imperative mood. Present tense, continually. Let women keep silence in the churches. Does that mean, women, you cannot say a word. You're, you're not allowed. Too bad. That's what people interpret it as. It's a mistake. For it's not permitted unto them to speak, but they are commanded to be under obedience, as, as also saith the law. We need to read the next verse to find out a little bit more about what this is talking about. If they will learn anything, let them ask their husbands at home. For it's a shame for women to speak in the church. Well, what, this all goes together. Verse 34 wasn't just making a statement, and then verse 35, another thing, because Anne ties it together, so it's they're combining both. So what's it saying here? First of all, it's talking about someone asking their husband at home. So what is it talking about? Is it talking about women in general? No, it's talking about a wife. The wife is to ask her husband at home. Well, what was the problem here? You've got to understand in the olden days, and they still do this in Africa where I went over there and different places, the women were sat on one side, the men sat on another side. The men were educated somewhat, and the women usually were not educated, unfortunately, at that time. And if the woman didn't understood something, she'd call across the room and want to know, want her husband to tell her and give her some understanding of what was being said. Well, that'd be disruptive. And so they were just, this was going on in Corinth. They were dis causing disruption in the meetings. This is what he's talking about. Let the wives keep silence in the church. And so what they should be doing is, if they want to learn something that they didn't understand, let them ask their husbands at home. It's a shame for wives it's talking about, not women in general. The same word for woman is also translated wife. You have to look at the context to find out what it means. Sometimes it's women, sometimes it's wife. Or about equally, women a little bit more than wife, you see the usage down here. So you have to look at the context. So does this mean that women can't do anything? 
No, not at all. Remember, Philip had four uh, virgins that were daughters that prophesied, and prophecy is coming forth to minister the word of the Lord and to bring it forth for people. God wants us to understand that women can speak things in the church, and that is important. Regarding prophecy, verse 31, you may all prophesy one by one that all may learn and all may be comforted. There's no limit to number of prophecy, and what's it going to do? It's going to bring forth people to learn and be comforted. Well, if a woman prophesies, someone's going to learn, oh, that means the woman's doing some, he's going to teach that man or something. It's no problem. Now, it's people think that women can't do anything. It's a line teaching out there. Now, in the home situation, who's the head of the home? The husband is. And so the woman is not to usurp authority over the husband in the home situation. That's a whole different situation. This is talking about in church, though. So I want to help you be sure that you don't believe any of these lies and think that women can do nothing. 1 Corinthians 14, 37. If any man think himself to be a prophet or spiritual, let him acknowledge that the things I write unto you are the commandments of the Lord. Again, this is them writing to straighten these guys out on the way things were supposed to operate in the services by the Holy Spirit to allow order and things to be done in a proper way. And again, he's, he's telling them, you think you're a prophet, you think you're spiritual, you think you got everything right, you know. Uh, you're supposed to acknowledge that the things that I write into you are the commandments of the Lord. He was giving them the commandments of the Lord, what God said, this is the way you function. Verse 38, if any man be ignorant, let him be ignorant. The commanding statement is actually, let him stay ignorant. You know, God doesn't want that, but if people are going to stay ignorant, then that's the way they'll be. Verse 39, wherefore, brethren, covet the prophesied. Again, this word burn with zeal. That's a commanding statement. This is not a nice little idea. It would be a nice idea to be zealous to prophesy. That's interesting. It says it's an imperative mood. God is speaking to brethren. That's every one of us. You should have a burning with zeal and a, a desire to prophesy. It's a command for every one of us. And also, when he says, forbid not to speak with tongues. Some people say, we can't, you aren't speaking in tongues in this church. Well, he says, forbid not to speak with tongues. You can speak with tongues as long as you do it in an orderly way and for the purpose. You just don't always blurt out and start speaking and whenever it'd be a totally disorder. Also, you can sing in tongues during the praise and worship. It's not out of order at all. Forbid not to speak with tongues. It is a commanding statement. So what's he doing? He's correcting all these problems. Verse 40, let all things be done decently and in order. Again, this is another commanding statement. Let all things come to pass or be accomplished, become, become decently and in order, that everything is to be done. God has an order for the things that he does. Now over in 1 Corinthians 15, we pick up at verse 33 as we're looking at commands in the New Testament. In verse 33, he says, Be not deceived. Again, this is another commanding statement. Remember, whenever he gives a commanding statement, that means people were being deceived about such a thing. Be not deceived, he says, evil communications corrupt good manners. The word communications really means companionships or who you're really having fellowship with. Evil companionships means you don't want to have companionship with people that are not walking right. Corrupts or destroys good manners, or this refers to your character, It'll, it'll affect you. What does that tell you? You don't follow with uh, getting fellowship with people that are not walking right. You don't have fellowship with people that are unrighteous. You don't have fellowship with people that are walking in sin, that are not, that are worldly. You don't have fellowship with them. Evil companionship will corrupt your good character. There'll be a transfer of spirits that'll happen if you allow that to go on. That's why God wants us separate from those people that are not walking right. We minister to them, but that's not what we're going to be fellowshipping with or companion with. Verse 34, another command. Awake. This is the commanding statement. God is commanding you and me to awake to righteousness. What's the way we're to walk in? Righteousness. And sin not. We're commanded to wake to righteousness and sin not. So essentially saying, I'm commanding you don't sin. Awake to righteousness. Walk in, walk in the way of righteousness. That's why God would never command something if we couldn't do it. We can awake to righteousness by walking in line with God's word, and we are not going to sin if we do what he says. 
Of course, some have not the knowledge of God. Of course, why were they sinning? They didn't have the knowledge of God. They didn't get the word in them. And he says, I speak this to your shame. You and I must get the word in us. And we must be doers of the word. If we don't have the knowledge of God, it's actually, it's a shame to us that we haven't studied the word and gotten the word in us. And we'd be walking around in sin. Awake to righteousness. That's the commanding statement. He expects every one of us to get the knowledge of God. Another commanding statement in 1 Corinthians 15, 58. Therefore, my beloved, be ye, or become, steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord. For as much as you know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. What does God want? He wants you and I to become steadfast and immovable. And this is, again, imperative mood, present tense. That shows that this is what you're supposed to be doing. You're supposed to be doing the work of the Lord, wherever you can go. Pass out tracts, talk to people about Jesus, be ministering to people. You're here, remember, to, to be an ambassador for Christ, to carry out the ministry of the Lord. So become steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord. God has called us to carry out the work of the Lord in our life. Over in 1 Corinthians chapter 16, these are commands, remember. These aren't just nice suggestions. Every one of these you should be saying, yes, I'll take hold of that and put that in operation. If I haven't been doing that, I need to get an order. I've got to come in line with these things. I need to start putting these as priorities in my life that I'm going to do. 1 Corinthians 16, verse 1. Now concerning the collections for the saints, I've given order to the churches of Galatia, even so do ye. Do is a commanding statement in the imperative. And he goes on in verse 2, another commanding statement. He says, on the first day of the week, let every one of you lay by him in store. You're to lay up in store as God has prospered him, that there be no gatherings when I come. As God, <clears throat> as God has prospered you, then you're going to lay that up in store, and each week you would bring it in, however you're paid. If you're paid once a month, you're going to do something once a month. If you're paid, you know, every couple of weeks, then you're going to do something every two weeks. Every week, you're going to do something every week. As you are paid, then you are going to bring the tithes and any given offerings that you might have unto the Lord. God has commanded us to do this. So uh, as you, now I've had some people, you know, they got paid, and they, I remember they called me up, and it was like on a Tuesday or something, and they said, well, I'm going to bring this over. Can I meet you at church? I want to bring them. I just got paid. I said, well, no, the Bible says you lay up in store as you have prospered that week, and it was on the first day of the week when you gather together. Come. You don't have to run that very moment and, you know, pay your tithes or whatever else. Some people have had to do that and try to help them say, it's not necessary. God has just said, just bring it to the next time when we have a service, you know, if you, as you prosper, and bring it unto the Lord. So that's God's, the way he has set things. We see in 1 Corinthians 16, verse 13, watch ye, there's four commanding statements here. Watch. Every one of us are to spiritually watch. Spiritually be attentive so we're not deceived by the enemy. Stand fast in the faith. Stand firm. He wants every one of us to always operate in faith at all times. Don't get out of faith. Don't let yourself get into doubt or unbelief. Quit you like men. This is one Greek word which essentially means to be brave. God wants you to be brave, if you see below. below. Essentially to be brave. I don't know what quit you like men must be some old English phrase or something. It means to be brave. And then it says be strong. And this is the particular word kratao, which is a strength that's going to release power out of you, a manifest power coming forth. So God wants you to spiritually watch. These are all commanding statements, every one of them. Stand fast in the faith. We're always going to operate in faith. We're going to be brave and courageous. We're never going to have fear or draw back. We're going to be strong, having power, being manifest out of us, spiritual strength. These are commands. He expects us to be. And if we'll do what the Word says, we will become strong, and we will see the power of God in operation in our life. Verse 14, let all your things be done with love with agape love. Everything be done. Everything that you are come into existence, you become, come to pass, things that you're doing, this word again means, it's all to be done in love. That means you can never do anything outside of the law of love. Now, we can't let anything. So always make sure that you're, you're seeing people's valuable, precious, important. You're always doing things that are in line with the word of God. You never do things out of the flesh. 1 Corinthians 16, 22, here's another command. If any man love not the Lord Jesus Christ, and it's interesting, this word love is not the word agape. Notice, it's the word phileo. 
Phileo is like to be fond of, to be a friend of. Who's the friend of the Lord? The one who keeps his commandments. If any man is not the friend of the Lord Jesus Christ, because he's keeping the commandments of the Lord, being one who is, uh, uh, it's, it's a be, to befriend or be fond of, and essentially. Let him be anathema, which means let him be accursed. This word means let him be accursed. Otherwise, if we don't really love the Lord, we're going to be cursed because we're not doing what he says. We ought to keep the commandments of the Lord. And remember that scripture we looked at back in, when we talked about who's a friend of God. John 15, 14. He said, you are my friends if you do whatsoever I command you. So we're going to love the Lord Jesus Christ because we're going to do his commands. We're going to obey what he says. And therefore, if not, we would be accursed. Quite a strong statement that it makes. Now, over in uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 5. In 2 Corinthians chapter 5, we pick up down here in verse 18. All things are of God, who hath reconciled us to himself by Jesus Christ, and hath given to us the ministry of reconciliation. You and I have the ministry of reconciliation. To wit or to know that God was in Christ, reconciling the world unto himself, not imputing their trespasses on them. Imputing means charging or reckoning. God is not reckoning or charging people's trespasses against them. There's only one sin that he convicts them of, is the sin of not believing on Jesus. And he's committed unto us, the you and me, the word of reconciliation. So God wants you to take hold of the ministry of reconciliation with the word of reconciliation that you're going to speak to others. Now, we are ambassadors for Christ, as though God did beseech you by us. We pray you in Christ's stead, be ye reconciled to God. This is the commanding statement. You're going to go forth and you're going to speak words for people to be reconciled unto God with the word of reconciliation, and you're carrying out the ministry of reconciliation. That means God wants you to be able to lead people to receive the Lord. He wants you to be able to, you know, share scriptures to help people to receive Jesus, get born again, be saved. You should be able to do it. Every one of us should be able to lead someone to the Lord, not become across someone who wants to go get someone to help me. You should be able to do it. He wants you to be able, you're an ambassador for Christ. He's committed to us the word of reconciliation. That's why you learn everything in the good news for you. You can lead a person to be born again. You can lead a person to receive the Holy Spirit. You can teach them about healing and lay hands on them and minister healing, let them in a prayer for healing. You can lead them in deliverance and, and show them or talk about deliverance and how to cast out the demons. These are things that every one of us are supposed to be doing. 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 14. Be ye not unequally yoked together with unbelievers. This is the commanding statement. Become not unequally yoked together with unbelievers. It's a command. Some believers have a tendency to let themselves to be yoked with unbelievers or whoever comes along. It doesn't matter, you know, well, they're just a friend, they're a nice person. No, God does not. He wants you to minister to them, but he doesn't want you to be yoked together with them, where you're going to have fellowship with. It's speaking, yoked together, about having fellowship with one who is not an equal, someone who is not righteous. And he goes on and says what this means. What fellowship has righteousness, which is what you're walking in, with unrighteousness? This is someone, on a, it's, a, it's actually the Greek word anomia, which means lawlessness. What fellowship does someone who's walking in righteousness have with someone who's walking in lawlessness? None. So he's telling you, you're not to be doing, have, have fellowship with these kind of people. What communion has light with darkness? None. You shouldn't be doing anything that's of darkness. What concord hath Christ with Belial? Anything that's of the devil or wicked? Of course not. What part is he that believeth with an infidel? Someone who's not a believer in Christ. Do not compromise and have fellowship with unbelievers. What agreement has the temple of God with idols? That's why you can't have any idolatry in you and whatsoever, because you're the temple of God. You are the temple of the living God. As God has said, I'll dwell in them and walk in them. I will be their God, and they shall be my people. And then he goes on and he says, Wherefore, come out from among them. Here's another commanding statement after the initial one there about not being unequally yoked with the unbelievers. Come out from among them. That is a commanding statement. If you have had some fellowship with these type of ones, God is commanding you and me. No, come out from among them. And then he says, be ye separate. And again, 
This is the commanding statement that he makes. Be separate. Again, we see the imperative mood. And when he talks about be separate, this means to mark off by boundaries. It's you set the boundaries. I'm not crossing that boundary any longer. I'm not going to let myself uh, you know, be among these, these kind of people that I'm going to be in fellowship. I'm coming out for a moment. I'm going to set the boundaries. And it says, and touch not the unclean thing. Does God want you in fellowship with uncleanness? No. It's contaminating to you. And I'll receive it. You're to be sanctified and set apart unto the Lord. It goes on and says, I'll be a father unto you, and you'll be my sons and daughters, saith the Lord Almighty. That means God now. Before, he was talking about just being God to them. You know, temple, you're the temple of living God. Now, he's talking about being a father to you. That shows intimate fellowship, like a father to a son or a father to a daughter. He'll begin to manifest himself to you. Saith the Lord Almighty, and this means, this interesting, this word, Lord Almighty, is this word pantocrator, which means the ruler of all. He is the ruler of all. So it's not a nice little suggestion. The ruler of all tells you and commands you and me that you and I are to not be in any yoked together with unbelievers. We're to come out from all this. We're to be separate and set the boundaries in our life. Over in 2 Corinthians chapter 8, we see another commanding statement. Over in verse 24. Wherefore show you to them and before the churches the proof of your love and of our boasting on your behalf. The word show here, demonstrate is what it means. That's the imperative mood. He's commanding them that they are to show the proof of their love. Well, how's your love going to be seen? By your actions, by your works, by the things you do. If we don't see the evidence of love coming out, there's a problem. You should be showing forth the proof of your love by your carrying out the things of doing the Word of God. 2 Corinthians chapter 13, over in verse 5, we see another command. Examine, that's the commanding word in the Greek. Examine yourselves, whether you be in the faith. This means you're supposed to test yourself. Am I in the faith or not? Am I in line with the Word? Am I doing what the Word says? Am I speaking the Word? Am I walking in the ways of the Word? Examine yourselves whether you be in the faith. And he says also prove. This is also the commanding statement. You are to prove, test, examine your own selves. So you've got to take, your, you know, take a look at your own life and check, check it out and see, is this in line with the Word of God? Am I operating in faith? What, what's the proof in my life? What, what, you know, am I really doing these? Am I speaking the word? Am I praying the word? Am I doing the word? Am I operating in faith in all the things that I'm doing? Remember, God is a God who reveals himself to those who are going to walk by faith. And he expects us to. He says, without faith it's impossible to please him. He that comes to God must believe he is, and he's a rewarder of those that diligently seek him. So we need to be operating in faith at all times. And then he comes down here and makes quite a statement in verse 11 of 2 Corinthians 13. He says, Finally, brethren, farewell. Be perfect. Be of good comfort. Be of one mind. Live in peace. And the God of peace shall be with you. When he makes these statements, be perfect, complete, sound. That's a command. It's not a suggestion. It's not a nice little, you know, I'll try my best deal. No. It's a command. Be of good comfort. He wants you comforted. Be of one mind, or really of understanding, a mind, a mental understanding. Live in peace. This is, again, the commanding statement. He doesn't want us to get in strife or negative attitudes and so forth, and, you know, with people. And the God of love and peace shall be with you. So that's the promise of God. See, when we meet these commands, then the God of love and peace is going to manifest himself with you in your life. Praise God. One other thing that we didn't look at, uh, in 1 Corinthians chapter 16. Very interesting what it says here. All the brethren greet you. Greet you one another with a holy kiss. Well, that's what they did in their custom back then. And when it talks about greeting, this is actually a, a commanding statement that he made to them. Now, do we do that really in our culture today? Not really, but what pretty much how do you, you greet someone that's showing some kind of affection, such as like a hug or whatever all. I mean, don't be someone who won't show uh, a, a kindly affection to someone. We should be willing to do that. God actually commands him because we are to be showing that 
towards someone. We're talking about a holy type of affection. And just, you know, be willing to give someone a hug or, or encouragement or whatever. Galatians chapter 1, we pick up in verse 8. He says, Though we are an angel from heaven, preach any other gospel unto you than that which we have preached unto you, let him be accursed. That's the commanding statement. Anybody that brings any kind of a gospel that's other than what the Word of God says, he's accursed. That's why we've got to be strict on the Word of God. We've got to be right in line with the Word of God. We've got to be sure that the doctrine's right. Someone's bringing something contrary to the truth. He's in trouble. That's why I, mean, I see these scriptures. I say, hey, I, I can't make any mistakes. I've got to be sure I'm bringing forth the gospel exactly as it is. Otherwise, I'm going to be accursed. The last thing I want to do is be accursed. As we said before, so say I now again, if any man preach any other gospel unto you than that we receive, let him be accursed. He's emphasizing it a second time. Same thing, commanding statement. He's expecting them to do what is right. Then we come down to Galatians chapter 5 and we see another thing. It says, stand fast, and this is the commanding statement, therefore in the liberty wherewith Christ has made us free. He wants us to walk in the Spirit. He wants us now to walk in the ways of the Word of God in the New Testament. And be not entangled again with the yoke of bondage. Be not entangled again or ensnared is again that commanding statement. And what was the yoke of bondage? They were go back into the Old Testament law instead of in the ways of the flesh, instead of walking in the Spirit according to the New Testament law. And they were making a mistake. So you and I are commanded. It's amazing how we see so many people going back into keeping the Old Testament law. They're being entangled again with the yoke of bondage. See, the Old Testament law brought bondage. It was the law of sin brought the bondage, but didn't bring freedom whatsoever until you come into the New Testament. So these are commanding statements that he makes for us. We see down in verse 13 another commanding statement. He says, For brethren, you've been called unto liberty. Only use not liberty for an occasion to the flesh, but by love serve one another. The commanding statement is to serve. God expects you and me to be a servant. <coughs> We're going to serve one another. Imperative mood. Present tense. Continually. Therefore, you're to be a servant of others with love. Again, you can't just be serving yourself. You're to be serving one another. You call to liberty. Don't use it occasion of the flesh and do whatever you want to do. No. We're going to serve one another and be a vessel for God to flow through, always in love. It goes on and says in verse 15, If you bite and devour one another, take heed that you be not consumed of one another. Take heed is the commanding statement. He doesn't want us to be biting, wounding, hurting, devouring, you know, being destructive with words or attitudes or actions. Don't ever get into strife or any of these kind of things with any person. It should never happen. You should always be operating in love. You shouldn't ever be getting into arguments and, and you know, negative uh, relationship situations. Then he comes down to verse 16, and this is the commanding statement, is to walk. This I say then, walk in the Spirit, and you shall not fulfill the lusts of the flesh. We have this flesh. It's a sinful flesh that dwells in it. Sin dwells in it. If we walk by the flesh, we're going to serve the law of sin. God does not want us to walk by the flesh. That's by this body of death. You can't walk by your senses. You can't walk by your feelings. You can't walk by whatever thoughts come into your mind and desires from a human nature standpoint. No, you're going to walk by the Spirit. You're commanded to walk in the Spirit according to the Word of God, and that is very important. We see in Galatians chapter 6, verse 1, <clears throat> Brethren, if a man be overtaken by a fault, what do you do? You which are spiritual, restore such a one in the spirit of meekness. Seek to restore that person to come away from that sin area, that fault in his life. Consider in thyself also, lest thou also be tempted. Don't let yourself fall into that. Be sure that you are going forth in a spirit of meekness. You're not putting someone down. You're not condemning them. You're not jumping all over them. You're bringing a spirit of meekness, meekness in the way you approach people. And you're going to seek to restore. The commanding statement is seek to restore. And then he goes on in verse 2. He's got another one. He says, bear, which really means to take up or carry away, lift away, take up. Take up is what this particular word means doesn't mean to carry another's burdens. Take up another's burdens so you fulfill the law of Christ. You want to help them to get free. It's talking about someone being restored from the bondages that they're in. 
some people have missed this and thought, well, I'm supposed to, they're sad and down and everything's terrible and they're all hopeless, so I'm going to be like them. No, you're not. You're supposed to help them get out of that thing. Take up, get them free from the thing. Not to settle into the same boat they're in. No. You want to bring them out of that. And you're going to fulfill the law of Christ. Verse 4. Let every man prove his own work. That's the commandment statement again. Test, examine, prove. You and I must prove of our own work. What are your works doing? Are all your works glorifying God? Are your works doing what God wants? Are your works of the flesh? Are your works of sin or evil? No. Then you're going to have rejoicing in himself alone and not in another. Prove your own work. What is your work doing? Is it doing the things that it should be doing? Verse 6. Let him that's taught in the word communicate unto him that teacheth in all good things. The word communicate is the command. And God, what did God set up? Someone who's bringing forth the word, what do we do? All of us, we are responsible to minister back the tithes and our offerings as we direct, which is ministering to the needs of the church. God set that up from the Old Testament days. It's set up in the New Testament. Same way, carry over, that the tithes and offerings are going to meet all of the needs of the ministry in the church. We see over in verse 7, be not deceived. Again, we see this command, and we've talked about this before. Whenever you see this, this is showing you that this is an area where people are being deceived about. God is not mocked. For whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. So oh God, you know, he, he will understand. No, whatever you sow, it's going to happen. That's a law that works. It doesn't matter what you're doing. You sow to his flesh or the flesh, you're going to reap corruption and destruction. There's no way out of it. It's going to happen. You sow to the spirit. Of the spirit, you're going to reap life everlasting. Whatever you sow to is what you're going to reap of. Be sure you're sowing to the right thing. Don't do things out of the flesh. Don't things out of, do out of things out of the human nature. Don't do things out of your feelings or, or what's for me, me, me attitude. No. We, we do things <coughs> that are what God wants us to do, of the Spirit, that are in line with the Word of God. How do you sow to the Spirit? Everything that's in line with the Word. You think, what does the Word say that I'm saying? What does the Word say that I'm doing? What's the Word say about my attitude? What's the Word say about my thoughts and so forth? You want to sow things to the Spirit. And he goes on and says, let us not be weary in well-doing, for in due season we shall reap if we faint not. Our blessings, the things that we're sowing, we are going to reap. As long as we don't faint not, it's not automatic. You can't just give up. You keep sowing things in the Spirit, and in due season you will reap. God will see that that promise will come to pass. We go over to Ephesians chapter 4. We'll look at a couple before we close for this morning. Ephesians chapter 4. We see in verse 25. Here's the commanding statement imperative here. Wherefore, put away lying. Speak every man truth with his neighbor, for we are members one of another. He doesn't want us to be lying. He doesn't want us to be telling some half-truths. He doesn't want us to afraid to be able to, to say what the real truth is and sugarcoat her and don't want to hurt their feelings or whatever all or this. No, we just need to tell it like it is. Put away lying. Speak man, truth unto the neighbor. And don't try to speak anything that would deceive someone. If you're going to speak, be sure you speak it. What is the truth? Be angry and sin not. How can I be angry and sin not? If it is a righteous anger regarding something that is occurring contrary to the Word of God, it's not going to be out of a flesh, out of emotions, out of a mind mad about an angry, a fleshly anger. It's a spiritual anger that comes because of a violation or an injustice according to the Word of God. So it's not going to be, you know, just a fleshly thing. It's instead going to be a spiritual thing that, you know, Jesus was certainly angry with those ones that were the money changers. He went in there and drove them out of the temple because spiritually it was wrong. There was these people were carrying the money changers were in the temple instead of it being a house of prayer. It was all polluted with this. And so he had a righteous anger about what was going on, and he got rid of those guys and drove them out. So it's not going to be out of the flesh thing. At the same time, even if you have a righteous anger, it says, let not the sun go down upon your wrath. You don't let that go overnight. You know, people say, well, I'm still angry about that. It's a righteous anger. Wait a minute. If it went overnight, uh, now it's not a righteous anger anymore. It's in the flesh. 
It's righteous anger is only going to be short. Let it not the sun go down upon your wrath. What happens if you do? Now you're going to give place to the devil. You're going to give place to him. So what could start out as a righteous anger, that's okay. Just don't let it carry on. If it carries on for long, it will become a fleshly anger. It will become an area of sin in your life. And we'll give place to the devil. And here when we see this, giving place is a command. He does not, you're commanded not to give place to the devil. This is the commanding statement here. It means God doesn't want us to ever give place to the devil. He wants us to always resist the devil. He wants us to always choose the right way and not give place to him. Otherwise, a place is a place of residence. That's how demons come into us, by the open door of sin, allowing them to come in. Verse 28, let him that stole steal no more. That's the commanding statement. But let him labor. That's the commanding statement. Working with his hands the thing which is good that he may have to give to him that needeth. Otherwise, God wants us to labor. He wants, he'll prosper the work of your hands. He'll bless the work of your hands. We don't steal or take from anybody else. We just go forth and do what he wants, and he will bless us. Verse 29, another commanding statement. Let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth. Nothing is to go forth out of your mouth that's contrary to his word. But that which is good to the use of edifying, that it may minister grace unto the hearers. If you don't have something that's going to minister grace to the hearers, you have nothing to say until you're ready to speak the right thing. If it's not going to bring edification, you're going to zip it until you're ready to speak right things. Don't speak harshly. Don't speak you know, mean. Don't speak with anger. Don't speak and, you know, just blurt out negative words and so forth. No. We should only speak things that minister grace to the hearers and is going to bring edification to one another. Another commanding, sta commanding statement. Grieve not the Holy Spirit of God. That's a command. He does not want you to grieve the Holy Spirit. How would I grieve the Holy Spirit? If I'm speaking negative things, you'll grieve the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit's come to dwell in you. He's to lead you, to guide you. He's going to direct you in all the things you do. And you should be speaking the right things. You should not be grieving him. You should be releasing him, putting him in operation, whereby you're sealed unto the day of redemption. Then we see in verse 31, let all bitterness, wrath, Anger, clamor, evil speaking, be put away from you with all malice. The commanding statement is put away. God says put all this away. Bitterness, put it away. Wrath, put it away. Anger, put it away. Clamor, you know, evil speaking of any types. It doesn't matter what you're doing. Put it away with all malice. God does not want these kind of things coming out of us. And then he tells us what to do, the commanding statement. Be, which become, become kind one to another. I mean, be kind. Don't be abrasive. Don't be harsh. Don't be mean. Be kind one to another. <coughs> Tender-hearted. Forgiving one another. Even as God, for Christ's sake, hath forgiven you. That's what he wants. We should always be operating in that way. These are all the things of the character of God that should be flowing out of you. We're going to be kind. We're going to be tender-hearted not hard-hearted. We're going to be forgiving one another, not holding a grudge. No, we're going to let things go. God has forgiven us. If you and I will do these things and follow these commands, we'll have no relationship problems ever. We'll walk in the ways of the Lord. We'll see God's blessings coming upon us. We won't grieve the Holy Spirit. We won't be deceived. We won't give place to the flesh. Uh, we'll be serving the Lord. We'll be doing the works of God. All these different things that we've seen today. We'll, we'll be making right choices and bringing glorification to the Lord. We'll be uh, certainly building the right things in our spiritual life so we don't build wrong things. And we're going to be getting rid of all areas of sin. And we won't be deceiving ourselves. We saw several times. Instead, we'll be sure that we're walking the right walk and we'll be carrying out all the things that God wants in our life. Say this to me. Heavenly Father, in the name of Jesus, I thank you and praise you for the New Testament commands that are given unto me the laws and commandments of the New Testament that I entered into the day I got born again. I am responsible to obey the commands. When I obey the commands, I am walking with the Lord. And the promises will come to pass. The blessings will come forth. God will manifest himself in my life. I make the decision. I put the Word of God 
first place. I obey the commandments of the Lord. I am taking hold of all these and incorporating them into my lifestyle. I will be a hearer and a doer of the word, of the commands of the New Testament. Thank you, Lord. As I do this word, this is my lifestyle, and I thank you for your blessings that are coming forth because I am a doer of your word. In Jesus' name, amen. Praise God. Well, tonight we're going to continue on as we go get into the next part, which will be, we got more to go through in the area here of uh, Ephesians. We're partially through that, and we'll go on into, of course, following through the New Testament. All these commands are very important. They certainly are something that every one of us has to know. Because if you and I expected to do the commandments of the Lord, we've got to know them. You know, remember, we're not under the Old Testament commandments. We're under the New Testament commandments. A lot of people have talked about the Old Testament commandments, but they never talk about the New Testament ones. This is what we're under. We're not under the Old Testament. We're under the New Testament. So we've got to know them all. We carry them out. They're all higher law. They're all operating in the Spirit. They're all going to bring forth victory and liberty and, and freedom. And we're going to walk. We're going to have the character of the Lord Jesus Christ. We're going to be like Him. We're going to do the works of God. We're going to walk in fellowship with him. Father, thank you for all you brought forth. We will be hearers and doers of the word and follow the New Testament commandments. Thank you for all that you're accomplishing as we're taking hold of these and hearing and doing them and put them into our lifestyle. Thank you for much fruit as we hear and do this word. In Jesus' name, amen. Praise God. As we conclude, anyone here that's never received Jesus, personal Lord and Savior, most important